Welcome to the Nerd Party. Scully? Yes? Marry me. I love you and I like you. I love you and I like you. I love that woman. I love her more than sharks love blood. I love you. I do Hello and welcome. This is the second episode of Nerd Nuptial. That's right, the second episode. I am so utterly excited that I not only got you to guest on the Nerd Party, I got you to start your own show, do an episode, and you didn't hate it, and so we're doing it again. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and today we're going to be co- talking about a couple different things. Uh, we're going to eventually get to the X-Files revival. Um, but before we go into that, we wanted to have a, a little bit of a general topic. So we're going to be talking about rated R superhero movies and uh, the ones that might be coming out and the ones that have been. But even before all of that, now we've been getting some positive input on Facebook, on Twitter, on iTunes, and on the website. And uh, it seems that people really enjoyed our first episode. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. I actually had um like some coworkers even come up and talk to me about it because you posted it on social media. So that was pretty weird. <laughs> yeah, it's also weird to know that some of your coworkers found me on Twitter and it was like, oh yeah, no, everybody's talking about you. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty weird. Yeah, my Twitter is not for people I know. It's for people I know online. <laughs> But speaking of which, we got some fantastic reviews on iTunes, and I have a kind of a rule on all of my shows, whether it's um, Senate Floor or uh, To The Journey, that whenever we get a five-star review, a written review, we'll mention you on the podcast. And our first one was from On The Rocks Media, a.k.a. Craig Sorrell. I I think he's okay with me using his name. Uh, He hosts Nerds With Words. And it's a great show. You guys need to check it out. It's uh, co-hosted by John Mills. And he wrote us probably one of the best reviews I've... I I feel like we could have written that review <laughs> if we were wanting to talk about ourselves. <laughs> like, it was so nice that it felt like I was like, did you write that? <laughs> I know, right? Like, you probably think like I went under a different yeah, name right? and, and wrote it myself. But I woke you up. Yeah, I fell asleep. You fell asleep and I woke you up and saying, hey, hey, we got a review and it's awesome. And normally I don't read the reviews, but I just have to read this one. <laughs> I just absolutely have to read it. It's It says, Paul Moadib and Cheney, Zoe and Wash, Swamp Thing and Abby, Walter and Meth. They have nothing on the perfect pairing of the girl and Tristan as they discuss the shared nerdy bits that bind them together as a couple. Packed with witty banter, great commentary, and discussions that will titillate your nerdom, this show is pure fun to listen to. That's so that, awesome. That, that's an amazing review. And the thing is, it, it, like, there's other great ones too. We got a five-star review from Rachel from STL. Now, she's a huge supporter of all of my shows, and she's a great person to follow online. Thank you so much, Rachel. And also, uh, uh, somebody by the name of O oh, the Profanity. I I think you know her. I, I, I don't know. Maybe like <laughs> maybe we've Just met. Just a little bit. Yeah, maybe we've <laughs> met long ago, and, you know, something passing. But thank you for the five-star review. And then we just got one today, or actually yesterday, from a star's hollow mass. Now, I like the name. I know. I, I have no <laughs> idea who that is, but kudos on the name. Yeah. Because I don't actually, we didn't talk about it last week. Why, why would we talk about it last week? But um, some of you might know that uh, from listening to previous episodes of the Senate Floor that we are huge Gilmore Girl fans. Well, actually, you were a Gilmore Girl fan before I was. That's right. Um, because, Years you resisted yeah, me. Yeah, because um, when I first met you, you had all of the seasons on DVD, and I thought it was really weird. <laughs> and not, I think it was last year. Or maybe it was this year. No, it was 2015. Okay, in 2015, we started, you finally convinced me to watch Gilmore Girls. And finally. I loved it. And I was like, why was I resisting this for so long? And <laughs> I have no idea why. I don't why know. do you ever resist me on media? I don't know. It's, exactly. That's yeah. right. You shouldn't do that. I know. <laughs> but the thing is, is that it was released on Netflix. And it was a big deal to me that it was released on Netflix because I always knew that it was filmed on actual film. And that it was shot with 16 by 9 framing. 
And but the DVDs were all standard definition and four by three, and it always frustrated me just because I knew that stuff was there. It's a big deal in our house. It's a big deal in our yeah, house. Yeah, we won't buy anything that's like that. No, we. I'm slowly trying to get rid of all these old DVDs that have cropped like like widescreen bars on it, whether it's pillar boxing or on the top and bottom. It's a struggle trying to find replacements for them. <laughs> and a financial struggle. <laughs> and a financial struggle. That's my struggle. yeah it's your struggle speaking of x-files that's I was gonna say. my struggle <laughs> um but and so and they released hd transfers 16 by 9 on netflix and apparently the world just went insane they because they were released on netflix it kind of opened it up to old fans as well as a new generation of fans and because of that we're getting a gilmore girls revival yeah but now i'm scared because right. of after <laughs> what we just watched with the x-files i'm a little freaked out because yeah i don't know it, yeah I, i'm a little scared too because scared. you know for those of you who don't know that there was two showrunners there they were called the paladinos and they ran the show like they created the show and there was a, it's a married couple they created the show and ran the show for six years and they were the writing staff that's like our dream jobs oh right gosh. there like that would be amazing if because we, we always talk about how can we how can we work together because we we're a little obsessed with each other <laughs> we like each other a little too much we always talk about like what can we do that could you know we'll quit our jobs and mm-hmm. then we'll just you know hang out together all day long and uh the only thing you could find was like if we were in the hospitality business or something like that yeah or like <laughs> or camp counselors yeah and i'm like um mm, no, no I don't to think both so. of those, yeah. <laughs> we didn't go to school for that, and <laughs> I don't think I want to be a camp counselor. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that that is absolutely our dream job is to you know be showrunners and that'd be pretty writers show, or it'd yeah. be writers. But the only way that we'd be able to do it, it, live that lifestyle, is if we were living that lifestyle together. That's true. Yeah, because, it still would be pretty stressful. Yeah, absolutely. But the the Paladinos, they uh they wrote most of the episodes or at least, you know, came up with the stories for all the episodes. They, sure they hired like freelance writers and, you know, like hired ri- writers here and there, but uh to help them out, but they did not have a writing staff. They didn't have a writers room. That is absolutely crazy. That is unheard of to not have a writers room for such a successful show. Yeah. And so when season six came around, like when they were ending season six, they're like, okay, if you want us to go, they went to the execs. They said, if you want us to go another season, you're going to have to hire us a writing staff. And of course, the studio execs in their wisdom said no (laughs) (laughs) and said, you've done it six years. You can do it for another year. And they said, no, we quit. And they left the show. And then other people took it over. And so the execs had to write, had to hire a writer staff anyway because they left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, though, <laughs> a lot of people don't like season seven. You and I loved season seven. Yeah, because I, I feel like they kind of came back to what it needed to be at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I feel like they were going in a direction with the characters that we were not okay with. <laughs> um, especially with like the Lorelai storyline with Chris and whatnot. Yeah. But we, I mean, I loved the ending episode so much. I was like crying so much during that episode. (laughs) In in my opinion and in your opinion, it was perfect. It was one of the most. It was wonderful. It was one of the most satisfying series finales I've ever had. And I like season seven. It was very clear that season seven was not a Paladino season. Right. That's very clear. And we're not arguing that. But we had such hatred for the Paladinos last season. Yeah. That it was refreshing to see somebody else's take on it. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It was nice just and, so that they kind of honored those characters um, yeah. in the way we wanted the, the show to end. <laughs> exactly. And so, like, we're not going to spoil it for you because you guys, if you haven't seen it yet, I don't care what gender you are, what demographic you are, there's something for everyone in the show. And I think you guys will enjoy it. So we won't ruin the ending, but the ending, in um, our opinion, was absolutely perfect and satisfying. And so, you know, after, like, if there's a revival there's kind of only a chance to screw it up, right? Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. Um, I'm afraid to, like, spoil anything. Um, well, we could just say that, like, certain people, like, we're scared that certain people might still not be together. Right. Or, or certain yeah. people might be together when they shouldn't be. Right. Or, or be less change. independent than they should be. Less independent than they should right. be. Right. Yeah. So I just hope that they still honor those characters the way that they left them. Yeah. And one thing that's interesting about this Netflix revival is that they're going to do four 90-minute episodes, and it's rumored that each episode is going to represent a season. Which is so perfect. Which is so perfect for Gilmore Girls. Yeah, that was 
that was a lot of the show was mm-hmm. seeing the town at different times of year. Yeah, the changing of the season. Yep. Like Lorelai was obsessed with the first snow. Right. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, now I want to watch it. I know. Again. I want to watch it again. Now. <laughs> well, we just finished our Parks and Rec rewatch. That's so right. We, we did. need something else. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this would have been a good segue into the X-Files revival. That's true. But screw that. We're not going to okay, do that. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say that's perfect, but whatever. <laughs> it's our show. We can do it's, what we want. It's our show. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> as you know, and as the world knows, yeah. uh, Deadpool came out. It was released on Valentine's Day, which I think is hilarious that it was released <laughs> on Valentine's Day. It's the right color scheme. You know what? I didn't even think about that. That's pretty... <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't think about that? No, I never thought... It... That's pretty oh. spot on. That's oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was... Appropriate. <laughs> and you know the color of blood whenever he decapitates someone? That's right. Yeah, it's yeah, like Valentine's it's Day. It's very festive. Hopefully. I haven't seen the movie, but hopefully he ripped somebody's heart out. And it was just like an homage to the day. To St. Valentine, because that's, that's right. what it's all about. Yeah, that'd be awesome. We have not seen it. Though. No, we have not seen it. Now, okay, here's the thing. For people for people who are yelling at their radios or their iPods, or do people still have iPods? Um, no, because whenever I say that in class, all the kids are like, iPods. <laughs> what, are you, what generation are you from? And I'm like, iPods are a big deal. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> like, why don't you still keep your music on a device that you can't make calls with? <laughs> what are you, Amish? <laughs> but I really don't, so I feel, yeah. Yeah. No, your, your kids definitely do look at us like dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. weird because we're not even 30. No. And yet they look at us like dinosaurs. We Okay. We were helping out a <laughs> – we were helping out yeah. one of your students. That's true. And uh, she, she's a senior and she's, she's a very talented actress and she wanted to audition for certain colleges and so she had to make an audition tape. I helped with the filming aspect. You helped with the directing aspect. And – she came out of the gate and she was performing character, but she was like she was performing it like really rickety and like just kind of like a uh, like, like very old, very old and like hunched over. And I asked her, I said, it was like, you know, like, are you playing an old woman? I mean, like what, you know, like what's the deal? And she's like, well, actually, Mr. Riddell, uh, she is like 30 or 35. Yeah. And you were like, are you kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> She was pretending like she had like a I cane. Know. Oh, I was dying. Or it was scoliosis. So hilarious. I was like, well, that's how 30 looks to a, an 18 an year old. An 18-year-old. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> so sad. My favorite comment uh, one time a kid told me, she's like, oh, Mrs. Riddell, you look like you could be in your 20s. And I'm like, thanks. I am in my 20s. <laughs> I remember you came home that day. I was so offended. I was like, wow, I look good for my age. I look like I could be in my late 20s. Thanks. <laughs> well, she didn't say late 20s. That's true. Not 20s. at that time. It was a while ago. Not at that time, yeah. <laughs> uh, also, there was a time we were in Hawaii. And... Oh, shut up. <laughs> Don't tell that. No, I'm totally telling the story. So we were in Hawaii and we were swimming in a cove. Yeah, uh, yeah the, r- the seven sacred pools. The seven sacred pools. That's right. And we do not wash our pits in the sacred pool of tears. That's right. As we've learned from Just Kung like Fu Panda. Panda. <laughs> um, we were, yeah, we were swimming in Hawaii, which sounds very ritzy, but like... It was it was really hard to get there. It was really hard to get it there. It was like very challenging. It was like an adventure for us. We had to drive up the mountain in a yeah. windy road. It was like mm-hmm. the back of the road of Hana. Anyway, yeah. so we were in the pool. We were in the seven sacred pools or whatever. It was having the time of our lives. Gorgeous. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was surreal. And we wanted to climb up the rocks, but we couldn't find a foothold. And this young girl, like, like a swam, teenager, <laughs> like a teenager, swam by you and said, "Ma'am, ma'am, there's a, a uh, there's a, a ledge over there that you might be able to use." And like said, I was oh, this feeble you. person, <laughs> and she called me "ma'am," and I was that was the first time someone had ever called me "ma'am" before, and I was just like <laughs> dying inside. I was like, "Oh my gosh, she can tell I can't get out of this pool, <laughs> and she's trying to help me, which is really nice, and but she's calling me ma'am." <laughs> So it was so sad. It was such a low point. <laughs> yeah, it was. That was a dark day in the Riddell household. It was like such a wonderful day, but clouded with that moment <laughs> uh, of me feeling old. What were we talking about? We were talking about Deadpool, right? Yeah, yeah, we were. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we were talking about Deadpool, and Deadpool's rated R, and everybody knew it was going to be rated R because if you've read the comics. You know that it, he's cheeky, he's vulgar, he swears, he kills people like crazy, and it's you know it, that's that's what the comic is. And so apparently they made a very true adaptation of it. You know, a lot some people complain like, oh, it's you know it's childish and it's vulgar. And I was like, yeah, of course it's childish and vulgar because that's what the comic is. 
it's I'm interested in seeing it, but it takes a lot to get us to the theater. That's because we don't like people. No. In our movie viewing experience, we no. love our friends, we love the people that we care about, but when it comes to the theater going experience, we are pretty snobby. <laughs> <laughs> because people smell, they make noise, they're rude, they put their feet up, you know, it's just Yeah, oh. they talk. Craig, you know what I'm talking about. They talk, which is and it's always like we I, I kinda say a little prayer. I say my <laughs> theater prayer whenever we go into a theater. I'm just like, please Lord, bless us with people that are not rude or loud or obnoxious so that my husband won't have to tell them to be quiet and be the world police. That's what I do every single time we go into the theater. Well, we had a good experience with The Revenant and Force yeah. Awakens. Yeah, it's true. So I'm, recently. I'm, yeah, recently. We've had good so. experiences. I'm pretty excited the, for the future. We even say that after we get out of a the theater. We're like, that was a good audience. We're proud of them. <laughs> yeah. We always mention that. That's usually like yeah. the first thing that we say. We're like, yeah. before you even it's say, good. did you like the movie? It was like, yeah, the audience was good. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. Because it's always <laughs> such a struggle for us. Yeah. We would much rather, and they do this sometimes with certain movies, rent them off of iTunes mm -hmm. and just watch them. Yeah. See, that's the thing is that like we have a gigantic TV mm -hmm. and we have an a kick-ass sound system and so i just there's i don't know obviously you want to see force awakens on the big screen and obviously you want to see revenant on the on the big screen yeah. and so that's what we did but with deadpool i really feel like we could watch it on the small screen i'm and sure a lot of people don't agree with you i know i'm sure people are screaming but it's also not really our cup of tea because we don't it's not our type of movie it's more yours than mine i would assume but yeah i, I mean know. i love I, I think the humor is going to be good but i really don't like vulgarity for vulgarity's sake and also over the top violence. Some, like I mean, I like Tarantino here and there. So. I was gonna say, we're we're a little hypocritical sometimes when it comes yeah, to that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We like what we like. But anyway, the entire reason why we brought this up now that we're twenty minutes in <laughs> is Deadpool us. was rated R, and it should have been rated R, and it's making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Ever since then, people have been saying like, "Oh, are we going to see more rated R superhero films?" and it's kind of been a self-fulfilling prophecy because all of these reports are coming out where it's like, oh, the new Spawn film, the, the Spawn reboot or remake or whatever, like that's going to be rated R. But that's no big surprise because that's a rated R comic. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, Wolverine 3 with Hugh Jackman that was just announced and everyone's saying that's going to be rated R. Really? Yeah. And... And, but it's not confirmed yet, I don't think. Okay. And so, but all of these projects are coming out. And on top of that, Batman versus Superman, it, it, it was, it's rated PG-13, and we all know it's rated PG-13, but they just released information saying that a rated R Blu-ray is going to come out. Like, so once it's released on home video, we're going to get a rated R cut for violence. And I wanted to know what you thought of that. Well, I think about your... Um... Your little second cousins um, mm -hmm. that are obsessed with, you know, like Batman and all the comic books. And we, we love talking with them and their parents because they're like-minded and we like to talk about comic books and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I think about how hard it would be to have, like, kids who want to go see those movies, but there's just no way. Yeah. You know, and I feel like, I mean, yes, those comic books are not meant for children, like Deadpool was not mad. I remember yeah. you actually even saw a little kid dressed up as Deadpool a few years ago at a convention. Yeah, and, and you it was were adorable, like, but yeah, frightening you were at like, the same time. This is frightening but cute, and I don't know how to feel about it. And <laughs> where are her, his parents? And <laughs> but um, I don't know. I just think about that, and I, I feel like maybe that's not necessarily the wave that we should be going towards. I mean, I'm not saying that you know they should be rated G necessarily, yeah. but um, I mean like Suicide Squad. I'm so excited about and. You know, that's – is that rated R? No, that's rated PG-13. PG-13? Yeah. But you could see how that one would it, be rated R. I could R. see how that would be rated R just because of how gritty it looks. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Some people are – I had a nice conversation with somebody online about it. And um, here, here's the thing. Dark Knight, The mm -hmm. Dark Knight by Christopher Nolan. You've heard of it. Oh, yes. It's yeah. a – kind of a stapler in our home <laughs> <laughs> it's a the go-to batman film in that's our home. a that's a pg-13 film but apparently the first reports were that the first cut that nolan made was a rated r batman film hmm. 
and he had to cut out a lot of violence in order to get that PG-13. And I think the scene that's most evident where it looks like something is missing is in the scene where Joker is playing possum and they throw his body on the pool table Mm. and then he jumps out. He's actually alive. And then he puts the knife in the dude's mouth Mm -hmm. and then he says that speech about how he got his scars and then the they cut away and the the music swells and hits and we just assume that he cut his cheek but then the guy just falls over right you I'm, could imagine yeah. that there would be a lot of blood in an art rated r version of that i think that there was a lot of blood i think we act, i think we had a close up and there was probably even more torture there yeah and so i'm glad that they cut it out but I also kind of wanted to see what those bits were. And so that's why I'm happy that we have a choice with Batman versus Superman. Yeah, that is nice. But how it's PG-13 theatrical. And if you want, you can see the R version. But some people are saying, you know, like, Batman, I can understand. But Superman? Oh, just because of the, the nature of what Superman is? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I I understand the need for maybe grittier rated R stuff, but... I also like. I just go back to like. Do do we need it? Is it is yeah. it is it just in excess? Is it just to have an R rating? Yeah, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Is you know, if it doesn't have to be right, right, then like, make it more for the masses. Is it? I think that's the thing. Is that like you're guaranteed to make more money with PG thirteen mm-hmm. um, on average? I should say uh, because it's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. I should say on average, uh, PG thirteen movies make more money than R. And that's why a lot of people don't want the R rating. But we've kind of had this pendulum swing back where rated R is cool again. And, (laughs) you know, like we had The Wolf of Wall Street, which was hard R. You know, like we had, you know, we had Girl with a Dragon Tattoo that was released during Christmas time. And people thought that that was going to usher in like adult, you know, R rated dramas again. So with Deadpool being a funny gritty like funny and gritty at the same time maybe not gritty but you know what i mean like yeah. you know, you know <laughs> gruesome right um i like what you said though do we need it i feel like deadpool needed it but does a batman and superman film need it i mean does it really add to the story right is and my I, question i don't know and i i mean i guess only if you saw both cuts could you actually make that determination but in my experience whenever there's like you know an unrated version it it doesn't usually add anything it's usually I don't know, just to kind of... Oh, we finally got to put in that extra F Right, word, or, or extra boobs or extra whatever. Extra boobs or whatever, yeah we, <laughs> yeah. we got that third nipple that we had to take out, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, just, just the third one? Just, just one? the third one, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, the, I mean, the MPA has really, really <laughs> weird rules when it comes to censorship. It's true. I don't, it's true. I don't make the rules, I just report them. <laughs> so. so I think, yeah, I think that's the main thing is like, do, do we need it? Probably not. Is it, you know, is it cool that it's there for people who want it? Sure, uh, but don't force it on us. Right. And I like that that's what they're doing with Batman versus Superman. With Wolverine, I don't know. I mean, like, Wolverine can get rough certain times. Yeah, but I feel like with that one, we have a precedence of other Wolverine movies mm-hmm. and, um, you know, the X-Men movies. So I don't know if we should. Like, you're kind of cutting out an audience that already has enjoyed Wolverine and has enjoyed good point. the X-Men. So... When you add that R rating to it, even like let's say there's a kid who just discovered, you know, X Men and mm-hmm. then they see that there's a new movie coming out, but they can't watch it because it's rated R. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Why do that? Then yeah, that's when it's already established in that franchise that, you know, these are rated PG thirteen or whatnot. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Some people had that argument with Star Wars about how all the mm-hmm. Star Wars films were rated PG except for when we got the sixth one, Revenge of the Sith, that was rated PG-13. I think mainly because of the last right, scene. Right, I was say. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, you needed that last scene. Right, right. You needed that to be gruesome. You needed that to be the goriest thing you saw in Star Wars because... It was meaningful. It was meaningful and everything was leading up to that moment. All all six, all, all five films before it were leading up to that moment because we heard about it. You know, like he was, he's more machine now than man. You know, we, we you know, we've all <laughs> yeah. heard that from Obi-Wan and then we actually got to see why. Right. And so I'm all for that. And then Force Awakens I rated think, PG-13 and so. Yeah, I think also um, people knew why mm-hmm. when they went to go see that movie. They knew that, you know, Anakin's going to become Darth Vader in that movie. <laughs> he's right. not going to be in one piece. So <laughs> I, I think that a part of that too is like they were expecting that. Mm-hmm. Um 
I don't know. But if it's already an established franchise, that's where I kind of, I don't know. Even with Batman, I, I don't know if I would want to see a rated R version. Yeah, see, that's, that's the thing is that, you know, like in the comics, and you've read some of the comics, mm-hmm. um, where, you know, like Batman can get pretty brutal. Oh, yeah. You know, like, and I think a lot of the times, like, he will allow people <laughs> to be hurt <laughs> more than he hurts them. That might That might be an overstatement, but I think you guys know what I'm trying to say. Is that like he'll throw somebody through a window and then, you know, they'll be bleeding out and he'll be like, hey, I'll take you to a hospital if you tell me what I want to know. You know, right. like, you know, that's right. more of... threatening in the moment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. To use to his advantage. And and we got a glimpse in the Batman versus Superman trailer that um, he brands people. I don't know if I like that. Yeah, I don't know. That. Uh... Like, I understand, like, beating a bad guy to a pulp in order to get information or to, because you're, you're pissed at him or you want, you know, you want to teach him a lesson. That's Batman. Whether you agree with that or not, I don't agree with vigilanteism in the real world, but in a, in a comic book world, it's something different. We understand that, but branding him, scarring yeah, him on my, purpose. My Batman does not brand people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of felt that way too. I yeah. was like, I was like, I wonder That's if like, a little strange. Hey guys, if there's any comic book evidence of that of Batman actually branding someone, yeah. please let us know. Go to you can email us at contact at the nerdparty dot com, or you can go to our Facebook page at facebook dot com slash the nerd party, or you can find me on Twitter at the insane robin. I'd love to know. I'm sure there's people out there who know if that exists or not. Um, so uh, there's a few uh, some some art rated R superhero movies. That come to mind real quick. Like the two top ones that come to mind are Blade, which I think was kind of an underrated movie that ushered in superhero films. Because I feel like X-Men kind of gets that honor of ushering in a new wave of superhero films. But I feel like Blade, like if X-Men led the way for everybody else, I feel like Blade led the way for X-Men. That was rated R. Mm-hmm. And that that's, you know, like he's killing vampires and he's... You know, like people are exploding and there's blood everywhere. You kind of need that. Yeah, elevating. you like that movie more than I do. I know, but, but there's <laughs> you also... don't get to watch that often because of that. <laughs> I don't. I really want it. It's on HBO right now, and I really wanted to watch it the other day. And you're like, mm, no. no. <laughs> uh, but also Watchmen. Oh yeah. So that one's you have a little bit more appreciation for it than than Blade. Yeah, I, but I think I even said this in the previous you podcast. Did. Actually, yeah, it is um. I appreciate the style more than the substance of Watchmen. Which I feel like a lot of people argue with that about I, Snyder in general. I know, but I I don't know. I just, I wasn't 100, I, I didn't really like necessarily any mm-hmm. of the characters except for, I guess I did like um, Dr. Manhattan. Yeah. But the whole owl storyline, um, I just, I don't know. Yeah. There are I certain understand. characters that I just did not dig on. There are certain times when I feel like, did that need to be rated R? I don't know. There are certain times when I'm like, yeah, it should be rated R because it was a rough comic. But then there's other times when I'm like, do I need to see somebody's arms get chopped off with a uh, power saw? No. <laughs> I personally don't want to see that. But... Unless that's what you're looking for. Like, if you're going to see, like, a horror movie, yeah. I mean, that's what you're expecting. And mm-hmm. that's what you're, you know, not that we really enjoy that type of <laughs> No, <stuff>. we don't. <laughs> my, that's that's for my other co-host, Matt Hansen. He's, he's the horror <laughs> film lover. Okay, well, we've Should prolonged it. Should we actually it. talk about the X-Files now? Yeah, we've prolonged it long enough. And for people who follow me on Twitter, they might have seen this already where I uh, <laughs> have complained. And we, okay, here's the thing. is like we prolonged it because we wanted to stay a positive as much as possible on Nerd and Uptual. It's just hard. It's just so hard because here's the thing. We're big fans of the X-Files. Oh my gosh, I love the X-Files. And we talked about that in the first episode. Yeah. Huge fans of the Love X-Files. the characters. Love the storylines. Mulder and Scully are iconic. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. They've permeated our culture. Everybody knows who Mulder and Scully is. Even if you haven't seen the X-Files, you know who Mulder and Scully it's is. It's true. Which is pretty awesome. That That's an awesome place to be as a franchise. And that's why I feel like they thought they could resurrect it. Because they're like, oh, okay. You know, why create a new idea when we have established intellectual property? Let, let's bring it back. And so, you know, you and I were skeptical but excited at the same time. And then in the first episode, we reviewed the first episode of the X Files Revival, and it was like, eh, you know, it was yeah, kind of okay. W- but now looking back, it, I feel like I have more appreciation for that first episode than I do for the others that we saw, What's <laughs> which re- is kind of sad. That is really, really sad, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, as soon as we were done watching, like, okay, the last episode aired just a couple days ago, mm-hmm. 
and we don't have live TV, so we just saw it today. I right off the bat, like I went on Wikipedia and I saw the reception under the reception column, and it said the first and last episode were met with mixed reviews, and the middle episodes were generally positive reviews. That is the exact opposite, yeah, of our、um, thought process. Well, C- kind of. Yeah, I, I mean, if I had to choose, yeah,、um, I would say the first and last one. Because they were more along the lines of conspiracy、yes. episodes, that's why I liked them better than the middle ones. But I feel like, from what like you even told me on online that you were discovering, is it was kind of like some people who had not seen the X Files before, yeah, were appreciating the middle episodes, where the, which were more of the monster of the week, which、mm-hmm. were、um, Mulder and Scully meet the Ware Monster,、uh, home again in Babylon. Babylon. Yeah, that was our least favorite.、Oh. Um, but I think, I think maybe it's because people were not used to. Maybe they had not seen X Files before. Well, that's or... that's funny that you say that because I I've gotten it from both sides.、Okay. Where right after Babylon, which was an insult to me, the franchise, and God Himself, <laughs> I, I said if the X Files revival had a face, I would punch it. That's what I tweeted. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> Matt Hansen, because he loves to make fun of me, retweeted and said, "This means that it's good, guys. You should watch it, just to be a jerk." <laughs> and somebody, somebody who follows him but not me, said, "That's really funny because I've been loving the episodes, and all of my friends love it too." And then I was like, "I was like, oh, that's weird." And then he tweeted again, saying, "Yeah, but I've never seen any of the X Files before." And I was like, "Well, then you don't matter." <laughs> like, that's right. <laughs> then you're not. Understanding how offensive this is to the characters、yeah. that were already established, like Mulder would have that. I'm sorry, but he, I know it was a dream sequence in Babylon where he, you know, he's he's line dancing, he's with line his dancing, shirt off mushrooms and involved. He's on a mushroom trip. It was disgusting. It was it was just the worst possible thing that you could do to Mulder. Like if you named one, th- like at the beginning before we ever saw it, if you were like. This is going to be happening to Mulder. I would have just been like, okay, well, I'm not watching that. Yeah, I'm not going to watch it. it yeah, was in, I was embarrassed for David Duchovny. I was too. I was just in shock that this was happening to me. Yeah, <laughs> you felt like it was happening to you. Like, yeah, it was just terrible. And the only reason why we kept going is because we're you know dedicated to the franchise.、Mm-hmm. But that was whew, that was bad. Now here's the thing: is like,、uh, hopefully you guys have watched it, and if you haven't watched it yet, we're not really giving away too much spoilers. With the first episode, it introduced this new wave conspiracy where it's okay, you know, there was a crash in 1947 with Roswell, and so the government used that technology and the alien DNA to do experiments on the human populace and to gain control. And so we're like, okay, cool, a different take on what we saw before, but very interesting. Felt a little rushed. And, and felt a little repeated, like we had talked about before. Yeah, a little repetitive. Yeah. yeah. And then we move on to the second episode. It's called Founders Mutation. That was very much just an X file, but yet it had a little conspiracy sprinkled in. I, I yeah, and actually thinking back on it, I think that was a pretty good episode. Yeah. I mean, in relation to the six that we got. Yes. Um. I、and、mean, it, did it? Did any of them match what the X Files used to be in its glory days? Absolutely not. But. That was not a bad episode, right? Because it was very much more true to the X Files, and it did have cons- some、yeah. conspiracy from the previous episode. My struggle, which I thought would be, which I thought was interesting, because I was like, okay, well, if this is going to help, if this is how they're going to do the Monster of the Week, then that's okay, because it'll have an overarching theme. Well, none of the other ones did. No. And what's really interesting, girl, is that <laughs> these were aired out of order. Really? Yeah. So that founder's mutation that took some of the conspiracy from the first episode was originally intended to be the fifth episode. Oh. So read this. That、it's, makes sense. Yeah. I can see that. It does, doesn't it? Because here, here's the thing, folks: is that the production order goes one, five, three, two, four, six. Really? Yes. That's so interesting. It's so weird, right? That's very odd. I have no idea why they did that. Like, so the only th- the only ones that stayed in order were the first one, the last one, and the third one. So the first and last and middle and the one. The third one was the Mulder and Scully meet the Wear Monster. Let's talk about that one. Okay. This one was your、um, your typical funny X Files episode. You know, for for fans of the franchise, you knew that there was kind of th- there was three types of episodes. There was conspiracy episode. 
you know, a mythology episode, there was a monster of the week, and that monster of the week could be two types. It could be serious mm -hmm. and gory or funny and lighthearted. Tongue in cheek. Tongue in cheek, yeah. That, mm -hmm. That's a good phrase for it. Yeah. And this one was definitely a tongue in cheek one. And for the first half, I, I loved yeah, the episode. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we were entertained. We were like, this feels a lot like past episodes that were very tongue in cheek, making yeah. fun of, you know, what was kind of going on and mm -hmm. you're kind of cheesing it up. It was it was cheesing it up, and we're just like, wow, this is true to form. Like we, you know, the first one was a conspiracy, little rush, but okay. Second one was a monster of the week, but was some, like about a metahuman, and you know, like some uh, conspiracy mixed in on top. That's cool. Now we're getting a funny one. Hey, this revival's looking pretty good, right? But then halfway <laughs> into the episode, it just went way downhill super fast, and it was so confusing because the monster has this conversation with Mulder in a graveyard and he explains the entire plot. Yeah. And he explains his entire history and it goes on for like 10 minutes. Yeah, it was really... I was just like, why is this guy talking about it? Why aren't we... Investigating. It, yeah, investigating. It's just like he finds him in the graveyard and they just talk about it. It was just a conversation. It was very, weird. Yeah, it was just a very, like you said, a turn. And you and I are all for conversation if it's oh, yeah. written well. Absolutely. This was not written well. This was no. written backwards and awkward. And it started off great and then just tanked. And I think that moment is the moment <laughs> where the entire revival started to tank. I think so too. Because after that, we get Home Again, which, orig which was originally intended to be the second episode. And that's the episode with the of trash the monster. Trash man, yeah, the, tra oh, trash, the trash man. monster, trash man. Ugh. This one here, the the re like there was nothing in it that was overly ridiculous or overly disgusting. I mean, a guy got ripped apart. That was kind of weird. Yeah. But the thing that made me it was kind of disgusting. I guess I it was like kind of disgusting. It was gross. But <laughs> <laughs> it was grossed out. <laughs> But you get some grossness in X-Files sometimes. Yeah, you do. So, yeah. you know, I think that's okay. But the thing that really made me angry is that there was no plot progression. There was only repeats where the trash man killed one time. Mm -hmm. Mulder and Scarlet are like, oh, this is a gruesome murder. He kills again. Oh, man, this is a gruesome murder. He kills a third time. Oh, man, this is a gruesome murder. Then they find the guy who made the uh the trash, trash man, man yeah and then the guy gives he gives another 10 minute explanation of why he did it and how this all came to be and you know <laughs> and then the episode was over and that was the same episode where scully's mom that's correct that away. was an interesting storyline that one was interesting and i i kind of wanted to stay with that storyline more than the trash man yeah. storyline and it, but it seemed out of place yeah with that storyline Usually when something like a crisis like that took place, I'm thinking about the episode called Beyond the Sea where Classic Scully's episode, dad, yeah. um, and we love that actor. What's his name? Brad Dourif. Bra okay, yeah. And he does such a great job of being like, a be yeah, he, he, yeah, psycho he's able killer, to like yeah. assume um, Scully's dad and, and, you know, like the Starbuck line. Yeah, channel the spirit. Channel he was able spirit. to channel yeah. spirits, yeah. And he, that was such a great episode just period. Mm -hmm. And I I expected more of that. I mean, not that I wanted a repeat of, mm -hmm. you know, Scully's dad episode, but it was always nice when they incorporated somewhat of the, you know, either mystical or science fiction into whatever situation was happening, you know, whether right. it was his, her sister dying or whether mm -hmm. it was um, her dad dying or, you know, wh whomever was, who, whatever family situation was going on, usually it connected in some way. Yeah. And this had no connection. No. I zero mean, connection to the case. It really didn't. Yeah. So it was a little disappointing. But I did like, like like we said, we like that storyline. We, yeah. We thought it was an emo emotional. We thought it was connected to the characters. And, right. Uh, but it Mulder didn't, being there for her. Yeah, and, yeah. But it didn't connect to the episode. No. And then we have Babylon. Oh, my gosh. It was just... I Okay, I did not understand... Coming up with the Einstein and Miller characters. You mean were... annoying versions of Mulder and Scully? Yeah, exactly. They even made her hair okay, red. Okay, and she overacted every single part that she... And I can say that because I teach acting. <laughs> so she overacted her part constantly, like in every scene. I was just like, 
oh my goodness, calm down. Yeah. I feel like she acted the way I would act because I'd be just so excited to be on the X Files. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like that's how she was acting. That's She's amazing. like, I'm here. I'm like a fake Scully. It's awesome. I'm standing in front of Scully that's and I'm right. a fake Scully. That's right. That's how I would react. That's, so. <laughs> maybe that is what happened. Maybe. <laughs> she just never got used to it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we, we got this, this. This episode was about a suicide bomber who got cold feet and but the like he was with another guy and so the other guy exploded but he didn't so he was his body was ruined and his head was caved in literally yeah and so the entire episode was okay well scully's like we're gonna use science in order to talk to this person in a coma my science my science and and Mulder's like well i'm gonna use experimental drugs to so my consciousness will link with this guy and we're like okay that's very much yeah, they're you know, two different sides. They're two different sides. And they also were paired up with their opposite. So yeah. he was with Einstein, Mulder was with Einstein, the, you know, new female version of Scully. And uh, Scully was with Miller. Yeah. Which was just like, oh, okay. It was like, really? Miller? Yeah, I know. Mulder, right? Miller. Mulder. And even in the last episode, every time he he said Miller, I thought he was saying Mulder. I'm like, are you, ta- are you saying their name? <laughs> yeah. It was like, why didn't you just put on Mulder and Scully masks while right? you were at it? Oh, my gosh. It was disgustingly obvious. It was ridiculous. And so, like, at the beginning of the episode, right off the bat, we get stereotypical Muslims. We get stereotypical hicks, like rednecks. The entire time, I'm like, no one's coming out of this picture looking good. Yeah. Like, I would be offended being just a person. <laughs> you know, like, it was just terrible. <laughs> and, and then, like, as we like we go into the hospital and the the suicide bombers in in the hospital he's laying there and then the nurse comes in and she turns off his machine oh my gosh and i was thinking like oh she's a part of like a, a government, government conspiracy yeah, yeah. no, no she's just a terrible person she's just a terrible person and then she started complaining about immigrants for no reason it it made no sense and the entire episode i felt really uncomfortable yeah i was just like this feels really bad and wrong <laughs> it just and then they wrong. have this half-hearted reaction of well not all muslims are bad and i'm like oh my gosh okay so you're are we even having this conversation is is, is this even like a thing i oh it was just offensive it was offensive on so many levels and then i'm not arguing with the sentiment that not all muslims are bad of course that's not what we're saying of no. course that's nonsense you're a bigot if you think that what we're saying is, is that they're showing stereotypical Muslims at the beginning and then having this like, like this off, off on the side comment of Scully going, oh, well, not, you know, just not all Muslims are extremists, you know. And then it's just like Chris Carter writing in his typewriter going, oh, see, I just saved myself. Like, it's cool. I, I can now do and say whatever I want. Yeah. And I don't know. It. I think you said something like it felt racist and politically correct at the, <laughs> at same, the same time, time. <laughs> and it was like moment to moment that we were feeling like okay now you're overcompensating for the content of mm-hmm. your episode it was just very strange but and apparently everybody <sighs> in the government is a racist except for Mulder and scully apparently according to this Appar- episode <laughs> apparently <laughs> and so you know all of that's going on and yeah because they were really offensive to like the family when they yeah. came in i was just like what is happening are there no good people in, in the, their environment like what it's ridiculous oh it's yeah. because we were in texas and texas is horrible right oh my remember gosh. i could not believe yeah they, oh. oh and well even the stereotypical of like you know playing the you know line dancing songs and, and when they get to the it, with, airport with the mushrooms 70, and oh yeah yeah it was just oh, oh yeah there was like tons of hats yeah like when we get to the airport 75 <laughs> yeah. percent of the people were wearing cowboy hats we go to texas all the time we do we have and we, we our closest rare. friends live there and <laughs> we very rarely see someone i was gonna in a say hat at the airport. <laughs> i was offended for them <laughs> our friends who live in texas but then yeah so let's move on i was offended for everyone in that episode <laughs> Let's move on to the worst moment oh of the episode. And so what happens is, is that Mulder takes these drugs and then all of a sudden we get this Spike Lee chest camera action where it's a close up of Mulder's face and there's music playing and he's dancing through the hallway. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. Like right off the bat, I was like, oh, this is, this is not going to end well. This is not going to end well. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden he's in traffic. And he's dancing. Then all of a sudden, he's in a uh, a, a club, mm-hmm. and then he starts dancing with the lone gunman. <laughs> like, and all of a sudden, the lone gunman is there, and which is wasted because they should have been like in there somewhere. They should have been more than in a crazy, terrible 
drug trip. Drug trip. Yeah, and and then like um, you know, uh, Mitch Pileggi was there, Skinner was there, mm-hmm. and the cigarette smoking man was there. Like later they again on. wasted Mitch. The wasted Mitch, and like he takes off his shirt and he just starts dancing around. He's like doing the hustle and gyrating. Yeah, and then it's like terrible. he has rings on that say "Mush and Room," and like this all sounds hilarious if it's outside of the X Files context, right? But that's the thing. We're inside the X-Files context. And it's just, as I was watching it, I was just like, David, why did you agree to do this? It was just upsetting. It was upsetting because it was offensive to the character that we had already established in mm-hmm. all of the other seasons. And now, I'm sorry, even though it was not real, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He still made a fool of himself. The, the actor made a fool of himself. And... Uh, I don't want people at home to think that we're like stick in the muds because <laughs> we love over the top stuff. Oh, we're, yeah. we're all for that. Like we're all for ridiculous, hokey, cheesy stuff. We love that stuff, but there's a time and place for it. And this was not the place for it. Well, and not in, you only have six episodes to tell whatever story they're trying to tell. Yeah. And especially like just thinking about the people who have seen X-Files for the first time there. I, it just, I don't feel like this at all wasn't a good indication of what it was like. Yeah. For those of you who have only seen this revival, please go back oh and gosh. watch the show because please. then you'll get a true sense of what the show is supposed to be like. Yeah. So then it moves on to My Struggle 2, mm-hmm. uh, which is the last episode. And it was supposed to be the last episode. And it very much feels like the first episode. Yes. It felt like, part, it, I mean, it was called part two and it felt like part two, but there were still six weeks in between. They said that over and over again. Mm-hmm. This happened six weeks ago. And we're like, we get it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, Because there's six episodes, yeah. With this, like, (laughs) this episode was all about the continuation of the first storyline about the government uh, using alien technology and alien DNA and everything like that. So apparently there are certain people in the world who have alien DNA. Scully is one of them because she was abducted. Mm -hmm. And so she was immune to anything that was going to happen. And apropos of absolutely nothing, everyone started getting sick. Like, our immune systems are null and void. They're shut down. There was nothing leading up to it. Nothing leading up to it. It just happened. Right. And this episode was trying to jam pack so much into it. It basically was a a like a a whole season in one episode. In one episode. And that's the thing is like if if all six episodes were about this storyline, right? This episode would have been good. Yeah, and the concept of this episode I liked. The concept was great. Yeah, and I I it kind of takes me back to the episode I even mentioned on on the on the Senate floor where you know, I my one of my favorite episodes was when they found the tissue samples of the small packs vaccine. So I was really jazzed yeah. when I saw that. I was like, "Oh, that's so cool! That's how th- these people are getting sick and that's why mm-hmm. they have all this, you know, the the DNA and whatnot." It was just out of nowhere, and there was no warning for it, and there was nothing, like, leading up to it. So it was just like, okay, this is what's happening in this episode. Yeah. And Scully apparently knew everything um, immediately, which didn't make sense. Yeah, there was no explanation nope. towards her. And, like, I, I guess, like, her only source was Joel McHale, but there was no explanation as to why Joel get... McHale knew all yeah, this. Yeah, how did he get that information? This was a great concept wasted on poor story structure with too much crammed in because everything was kind of told in reverse. Mm-hmm. Like, as soon as it got so frustrating, we were like, why is this happening? No one knows what's going on, and they're not even trying to find out what's going on. <laughs> I think even Einstein said that, like, yeah. right around the time when we were like, how do we know? How, how did this happen? Yeah. Like she even said that as a character in lines. And then, then they answered the question, right? And we're like, oh, okay, that would have been good to know five minutes ago. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not saying that we should have all of our questions answered right away. No, but they did it in a way that where the audience was just, oh, what is going on? Playing this is not up. making sense. Yeah. And then they explain it. Your audience should not have to do that. Mm-hmm. And there was just tons of stuff that. Like it was like it was shot poorly. It was edited poorly. Where they would establish some, like they would show a result of something, but then they wouldn't have established why that happened. Like for example, when Scully is walking through the streets and there's mobs everywhere because everybody's getting sick, nobody knows why. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, there's this person like there's this mob of people, and this guy pulls off a like a pole, like a street sign, and then slams it into a window. We have no idea what window it is. We have no idea what building it is. We have no idea what this person's motivation is. And Scully goes up to him and goes, no, please, go to the hospital. Everybody, 
go to the hospital. And the mob just listens to her. And then she walks away. What authority does she have in this moment, in this place, in the middle of this mob? She has no authority. She's just a person with with an IV bag. Like, yeah, with an IV (laughs) bag. That's all she has. Like... Was this guy trying to steal a TV? You know, like, was he right. angry? Was it a police station? Like, is it just anarchy happening because of the illness? Or is it, like, they're trying to get medicine? Like, what is going on? We had no idea. That was a microcosm of the episode. Yeah. Where things happened, but yet there was no buildup. And there was no establishing anything. There was no establishing story, establishing shots, establishing characters. It was just, crap happens. Right. And now we have to deal with it. And that's why if the middle episodes dealt with this like say like introduce it in the first episode like have the first two episodes deal with the discovery of the conspiracy and then have three four and five be the build-up saying like hey i think there's something wrong with our dna people are getting sick right it's like a lead up to this epic calamity you know situation and then when we have the sixth episode that's when the proverbial shit hits the fan right that would make sense that would be a great six episode absolutely and that's the way it should have been but Nope. Nope. They just try to cram all of it down our throats at the same time. And also, apparently, Scully is such a brilliant mind of science that she can oh, identify yeah. <laughs> a virus that was designed either by aliens or some of the most devious men on the planet, and she can and she can cure it yeah. within a day. Exactly. Well, no, hours. Hours. It, less it than wasn't a day. even a day. Hours. And apparently, traffic just opens up for Scully. Uh <laughs> Because we live in Chicago, and uh, there are times when I'm like, well, I guess we're never going to move our car. <laughs> and during this terrible... That's on a normal work that day. That is a normal work day. And, but during this terrible situation, Scully was able to get through all that traffic, which was just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> during the apocalypse. <laughs> That's right. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> she was I, able, you know, and she was able to find Miller and Mulder, which is just amazing. In her new <laughs> Ford car. That's right. So the, this, <laughs> wink to the audience. Wink to the audience. Yeah. <laughs> this. Yeah. These six episodes was a big Ford commercial. That's right. Um. There was. There was never, I'm not even going to talk about it. Like the the product placement in this in the revival. But yeah, it's just this showed so much promise, and started on the up and up, and then started you know like was like oh, okay maybe not but you know maybe it could and then just boom yeah. spiraled downward Ugh. and i just i think chris carter's lost it i think he's lost the ability to tell a coherent story to quote my friend john mills yeah i i just wish they had left it alone at this point yeah i at this point at yeah. this point that's how i feel um and why was reyes there <laughs> It was, it was so random, and I mean, I think they just had her in there just so that she could be in there. It she, was just like, hi. She didn't advance the story. No, she didn't. I mean, I guess it introduced the cigarette smoking man back into the picture because she said that you know he he you know offered her a cure a cure. But we why re- she was hanging out with him for that long, I don't know. We yeah, they never um, established why she was hanging no, out with him. No, it's like or- he saying, okay, I'll give it to you on this date or. And apparently for the past 10 years? Right. Like, so she's been hanging out with him for 10 years? Are you kidding me? No, no, no. 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 Annabeth Gish is such a poor actress. She really is. But I oh, never believe I, a single word that comes out of her mouth. During those seasons towards the end there where she was she was the focus, it was just really hard to get through those episodes. And then I, that stupid reveal of the whole Phantom of the Opera type thing with, with it just cigarette. made me laugh cigarette. I did me too because I was like oh they're trying to be edgy and that's so cute yeah it's like <laughs> that's how I felt it's like a mix between Phantom of the Opera and Gus Frank yes yeah they were trying really hard because they had that like whole reveal of like him taking off his mask and it doesn't have a nose I was gonna say it, but it just it's stupid it was, it was yeah. just very stupid I think a, a friend of ours came over to watch Better Call Saul mm. and he asked he knew we were big fans of the X-Files and he asked us how we felt about it and I summed it up with one sentence and I said it's like your grandfather trying to recite you rap lyrics <laughs> it's just not gonna work yeah that's what this kind of felt and like he actually asked an interesting question he said do you think it was meant for a certain time because it's being brought back it's just not meant for this time you know like it was in the 90s mm-hmm. it was you know early 2000s and now it's just it's time has passed mm-hmm. do you think that's part of it and that was an interesting thing I I think that might be part of it where these characters were in that time and mm-hmm. 
kind of leave them there. But part of it was just poor writing and poor story structure execution, and execution yeah. and all that. But you know what? When I when I think about that for a different time, Fringe was awesome, and it was a lot of the same elements as yeah. this. It was funny because when we got more graphic elements of the X-Files in this revival, it made me think about Fringe. Yeah. And I was like, wait, when I watched Fringe, it made me think of the X-Files. Yeah. And so we've come full circle where the X-Files influenced Fringe, and Fringe has influenced the X-Files now. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. And Someone little... needs to write a paper. Right. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> that would be an awesome dissertation. Um, <laughs> yeah. I And it actually kind of made me want to watch Fringe when I... The when first we, three seasons. Yeah. The first three seasons when, when we watched the X-Files because I was like, you know what would be better right now? It would be better to either rewatch X-Files mm-hmm. or go back and watch Fringe. Right. Because those are pretty good shows. <sighs> All right. Well, wow. We've talked for over an hour. Wow. Yeah. It's getting kind of hot in here. <laughs> All this heated discussion That's and right. yelling and yeah. the doors shut. <laughs> it's a little roasty. So, yeah, it's just X-Files revival disappointing. But if there's people out there who are completely disagreeing with us, I'm happy for you. Oh, yeah. I Like, I am not saying that to be pretentious or be cheeky. I legitimately feel happy for you. If you enjoyed this, then great. Then they struck a chord with you. And I'm not going to try to take that enjoyment away. And I hope that it encourages those people to seek out, you know, the old X Files. Mm-hmm. And you know, if this even was an inkling of what they like, then they yeah. should watch that. It's kind of like the J.J. Abrams Star Trek films. Like, oh yeah, you know, like if you like those, you have a lot to go back and experience. Right. And I know a lot of Star Trek fans who started out that way, where their first exposure was the reboot. And then they went back and were like, wow, these episodes are really great. And so hopefully that will That would happen. be awesome if that happened. Yeah. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. It was just a little disappointing for us uh, hardcore fans. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, this has been Nerd Nuptial Episode 2. Thank you so much for subscribing and going to our Facebook page and liking. Please make sure, like, if you hear the sound of my voice and you like this episode, you like this show... Please, 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 I cannot ask nice enough. Go to iTunes and write us a review. Don't just give us a rating. Although ratings are appreciated, please write us a review because it really helps the show out. I mean, we're we're brand new, and the more reviews we get, the more opportunity we have to get on new and note new and noteworthy list on iTunes, and then we can get more listeners and we can do more shows. And speaking of which, somebody else is on the new and noteworthy section of itunes and that's aggressive negotiations part of the nerd party network everyone needs to go and listen to them you can uh, find them on uh, the nerdparty.com and it's a star wars podcast it's hosted by matt rushing and john mills they do great work they ask the questions that you've always wanted to ask about star wars and also check out my other show the senate floor used to be known as the nerd party where it's a general geek podcast we love our top five lists we love our tv reviews and film reviews and that's hosted with matt hansen check out these shows we think you'll like them and remember just it takes five seconds on your phone just go to your podcast app or go online and write a review and if you give us five stars we'll talk about you on the podcast also i don't have any social media so i don't know that we're doing a good job unless i see them on itunes so you heard, <laughs> you heard it here first. If you want to That's tell the only the, way I can read that we're doing a good job. If you want to tell the girl that she's doing a good job, the only way to do that is to write a review on iTunes. There so you that, go. So there you go. <laughs> All right. So the begging is over. So thank you so much. Go to thenerdparty.com for everything that you need to know, our blog, our other shows, links to all the other episodes, and go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash thenerdparty, and you can email us. If you have show ideas, feel free to email us at contact at thenerdparty.com. I love you. I know.